I'm a consulting engineer here at Columbia Engineering. I've been here for 26 years. I head up all of our uh, company's land development work throughout the Southeast. We've been in business for 60 years. We're a full service engineering firm, so occasionally we have need for adding lift stations to some of our development. Ordinarily, when you have sewage from a development, it, it drains via gravity to a gravity sewer system. Oftentimes, that's not possible on sites because the elevation of the sewer, for instance, may be too high. And so to resolve that problem, the sewage drains into a lift station, which then pumps it to the gravity system. It allows a site that may otherwise not be developable, be developable for a reasonable cost. Really just weren't satisfied with the level of service that we were getting from some of those designers. Uh, the designers seemed to just sort of cobble together these lift stations using old school technology. Uh, required really a lot of work on our end to coordinate everything. And then we'd get through the construction process and oftentimes the items that the engineer had specced maybe weren't readily available, resulting in change orders and so forth. I was introduced to Dan Early and his group with Progressive Water. He just really had this cool concept of a turnkey package where they included all of the design and produced a modular plant that was shipped to the construction site, built to the spec. All the contractor had to do is dig a hole, pour some concrete, set it, and plug everything in. So we gave Dan's group a shot on a project we had down in Panhandle. I really liked Dan's idea of, of look, I'm just gonna take this problem, I'm gonna run with it and give Columbia the easy button. And he, he and his group certainly did that. Dan and his group have a knack for taking very complicated ideas and putting them in layman's terms for our clients who are ultimately paying the bill and don't necessarily understand the distinction of the different types of lift stations and costs involved. Honestly, I was amazed. I was really looking for the easy button so that we can focus on doing what we do best, which is not lift station design or managing our consultants. Concrete has a design life of about 10 to 20 years and then requires some pretty significant maintenance to go in there and refurbish that wet well area. The modular water system product is a polyethylene tank and it has a 100 year design life. And so that's just one of the many distinctions between a traditional type of system and uh, the modular water system. Yeah, I think as, as news of this spreads and it becomes more widespread and um, public utilities, but also private landowners uh, realize the affordability of this product, the great construction and reliability of it, and the ease of installation, I think it's going to become much more prevalent. We were just very pleased with the, the service that we got, the responsiveness that we got, no headache, and uh, we'll be using them in the future. I just love that ending the easy button. I, I've run this clip before, but it's, um, it's so good. And of course, I love our new tagline, water is the people's asset, because we are the ones who are making a water investable asset for everyday investors. Very proud. All right, let's get this party started. Water, the blue gold, and it's Thursday, July 27th of 2023, briefing number 221. And of course, we have the usual safe harbor statements. Now, I was at the Philanthropic Investors Summit recently, and here's an excerpt. And the reason I'm, I'm playing this excerpt, it's very short, is that I feel I, I, I was basically under the gun to like make it quick and say it all. And I think it was a good concentrated way to describe the value proposition of what we're doing. So here we go. Now, uh, the person who I'm talking to is Tom Cummins who is a fabulously successful man who I know personally, and he built American Power and Gas from a energy brokerage into a full-scale energy provider. And they service many states in America and now working on Europe for provision of renewable energy. Very, very cool company and expanding fast. So here we go. Uh, so quickly, just to summarize what's going on here, we've worked for years to crack a really hard nut, which is water treatment at the level of industrial water treatment. And uh, it's in, been in real trouble for a long time, but there's a lot of resistance to change. And uh, you know, with the help of Ivan and Artie and their team, we've done a huge amount, especially since the um, lockdowns began, that was really our call to action to really make things happen. We are busy creating this thing called Water On Demand, which privatizes the water utilities that are currently breaking up so that businesses get their own direct 
water treatment. They get they they are self reliant. They're able to recycle. They have predictable water rates. It's a lot like what you do in many ways. And they also are. But where are you guys? Where in the world are you doing this at? What 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 geographic location? Currently, it's the U.S. There's two parts to the problem. The first part is, let's assume that that the infrastructure problem is not being solved. The government is not funding water treatment systems. It's, it's not keeping up. It's been well proven. Well, then the solution is to unburden the system and to take all of that water treatment load and have businesses do it by themselves. And we're doing that in America today. And also, we are through a relationship with one of our channel partners, doing embassies all over the world. So it's it's the U.S. as well as embassies. And invariably, the embassy is has a code name. We don't even we don't even know where the embassy is, but. Right. Um, it's a fun project. The point I'm making is that the U.S. is in a strange place because it's just like how we were slow to adopt cell phones because we had landlines, whereas Africa right. was cell phones. Boom, just like that, right? America is still struggling with the legacy of a lot of old uh, water infrastructure that is incapable of recycling, that is very expensive, lots of water leakage, 20, 30 percent you know, wastage of fresh water into the ground. And so the solution is to bypass the system. And that's what we've done. So we created a company in 2018 called Modular Water Systems, which is the technology solution that downscales those huge utility systems down to what you might call a water system in a box. And that is extremely viable today. It's a a leader in the industry, it's profitable, and it's growing double or triple each year. Around that, we built a finance solution, which enables these clients to not have to pay cash up front, but pay by the gallon on the meter like they're used to, right? Right. And that's called water on demand. Now there's a a process going on right now, which I'm not allowed to talk about, which we announced back in February. So we love it. And I want to be especially say how amazing our investors from philanthropic investors have been in supporting us. It, right I can't man. tell you how many times it was in the nick of time that they came in. <laughs> there you go. Right on. So that was a cool event that was put on by philanthropic investors. And as I was saying there, they are super, super helpful to our cause. All right. Now, I teased this earlier today. So here is an announcement. As you can see, I will be commenting on it very little. So Origin Clears Water on Demand subsidiary signs a letter of intent to merge with Fortune Rise Acquisition Corporation. And here's the announcement. This was the one back looking back in January. Our subsidiary, Water On Demand, went into a non-binding letter of intent with a special purpose acquisition corporation. Now, the new announcement here is just happened today. Fortune Rise Acquisition Corporation as is hiring a Richard Brand and engaging Nelson Mullins. Now, why is this so important? Well, first of all, I have this saying that I basically created for myself back in the eighties, which is overkill works, do more. So it was going fine, but we felt we had to basically, the people over in the special purpose acquisition corporation felt that there should be more talent basically. And we agreed hundred percent. And so far from being overkill, we think it's exactly the right move now. So what that means is Richard Brand is a veteran CFO and hedge fund portfolio manager and running uh, capital markets. And he is just very, very good. And Nelson Mullins is one of the very top law firms in the special purpose acquisition corporation SPAC space. So that is the story there. I would like to review the announcement with you here. Well, let me just take a look here. I'm going to go ahead and navigate to the announcement and we will then be able to take a look at it. What is this about? Well, Essentially, Fortune Rise Capital, Fortune Rise Acquisition Corporation, ticker simple FRLA, is essentially what's called a, a blank check company or a special purpose acquisition corporation, a SPAC. And their purpose is to acquire a company. They themselves, they're not an operating company, they have money and they're looking to uh, acquire a company. And that's what the letter of intent was about. In the event a business combination does occur, uh, there'll be further disclosure in a registration statement called Form S4, which will have all the information needed. So I recommend if you want to know more by simply um, reading this press release. And also you can always send a message to Fortune Rising. This is all the 
the boilerplate, you can contact Richard Brand at this email address. Okay, so that takes care of that part and allows me to go back to the briefing. So that we're very excited about because that's a world-class talent and already some amazing things have been happening. And this is why we, you know, I pulled this out this week. I love it. If everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. It makes me think of, I, I watch clips of those guys do, you know, driving Formula One vehicles and just like, and, and those motorcycles, oh Lord, they go so fast. But strangely enough, they actually are amazingly in control, but crazy things do happen. The point I'm making is, Speed is everything. And as I was saying, overkill works. All right. Now, water news. Well, we have a sewer crisis in the state of Florida, and this illustrates the problem with central infrastructure. Take a look. So there's been a bunch of, of events, a raw sewage flowing into Sarasota Bay in December, quarter million gallons from sewers last year in Daytona Beach. Boca Raton, again, more being spewed. And basically it says we have failing water, base water systems in, across Florida, aging infrastructure. How many times have, have I said so? And no clear solutions for funding a fix. That is the ongoing problem. And so total of 1.6 gallons of wastewater polluting like crazy. So it's not just places like India and Bangladesh that are polluting the ocean and the rivers. It's, it's us, it's us too. And the environmental sphere will only get worse. Sewers need to be replaced. Something needs to be done. Well, who's going to do it? Here's the, uh, the truth is no one's doing it. You know, these aging lines, some of them nearly 80 years old, are not getting replaced fast enough. There's all kinds of issues with how it comes, but basically it boils down to money. Nobody bothers with it with utilities until they don't work. Literally, when Florida first introduced sewers, it was common for the pipes to be made from baked clay. Later cast iron, now PVC, which is appropriate, but... Again, we're stuck with the old stuff. There's an extreme need to have a comprehensive, holistic discussion. When you have a state growing like Florida, this isn't going to get any better if we're not dealing with it comprehensively. This is a state, you know, nationwide problem where the entire nation has D plus. And despite all this bad news, Florida actually had a C. So it's not even as bad as some of the rest of the country. Blue-green algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee and other rivers come directly from the nutrients in the wastewater. It talks about lift stations, which change the water level. Well, you know, uh, when power goes out, it's a whole big backup. Not great. So again, this, you know, supports our position, which is that here we go. We have a lot of infrastructure issues in this state, a lot of old pipes, but it's unacceptable. We are failing our state. Well, we agree. And what we want to do and what we're doing is targeting the people who have 90% of the burden on these systems, which is industry and agriculture, and helping them go off the grid. And this will lighten the load because hundreds, it says hundreds of billions. Where's the hundreds of billions coming from? It's not happening. Okay. Now, are they going to fix it? Here's the problem. Take a look at utilities. Nearly a third of them are concerned about covering the full cost of providing services. 20%, one out of five of all US households before the pandemic had unaffordable water bills. I believe that's got to be much worse already because things, people's finance have not, did not improve during the pandemic. And finally, more than half of all U.S. water utilities have problems with customer non-payment. So they can't keep raising the rates. They can't keep hitting on the consumers. The only way to go is, as I was saying, self-reliance for business is what's going to solve the problem. Speaking of pump stations, this is why our pump stations are killing it. It's because we have these high-density polyethylene or polypropylene uh, enclosures that last for you know a minimum of 50 years and really likely up to 100. There's just nothing else like it in the market. And we're cost comparable. So you pay the same amount of money and you get a much better product that does not degrade. And that's super important. Podcast. Um, this is an excerpt from a podcast I just did. And I think it was really cool. So let's take a listen. Just minding my business. Quote, for every drop of water you waste, you must know that somewhere on earth, someone is desperately looking for a drop of water. Mehmet Morat Ildan. Today, we are pleased to welcome back Rick Eckleberry to the podcast platform of Just Mighty My Business Media, LLC. Rick is a tech pioneer at the intersection of crypto and water who is using novel technologies to alert the public about the dying state of modern water infrastructure. 
He works to offer groundbreaking insights and solutions to the global problem of water supply. So today, this conversation is especially pertinent as we hear of historically abundant waterways disappearing. Welcome, Riggs. Thank you, ladies. It's a real honor, and I'm pleased to be back. Yes, pleased to have you back as well. Wow. So tell everybody who might have missed the first conversation what your company is all about. Well, first of all, what Ruth said is very true. Uh, that is a drop wasted here is a drop needed there. Um, and there's a couple stats um, that are really kind of drive it home for us. About 1.1 billion people worldwide lack access to water at all. 1.1 billion, almost 3 billion have water scarcity for at least one month of the year. And here's the, uh, the even more important one. Inadequate sanitation is a problem for 2.4 billion, which creates major disease problems. You know, I, I like to read historical novels and, and I was reading about um, the time of King Arthur, the year 500, and the, the sanitation practices were non-existent. And as a result, disease was rampant. Well, for 2.4 billion people in, in the world today, that's the case still. Cholera, typhoid, 2 million pe people, mostly children, die each year from diarrhea alone. Mm. Diarrhea alone. So here's the issue. The water systems are stressed. More than half the world's wetlands have disappeared. What we learned, uh, because you know, I, I had a journey, as, as Ida knows, I had a journey from high tech via um, what we were trying to turn algae into biofuels, and then we moved into the water space. What we learned in the water space is that it's demand is dominated by industry and agriculture, which represent 90% of all water usage, right? Now, those of us who, who have been stuck in California, we escaped, but those of us who are stuck in California were being harassed to take short showers and so forth, but we only represent 10% of the total use, right? What about the 90%? We have the, the um, American infrastructure, just like our educational system, is a mess. And our energy, and we, we have all kinds of infrastructure issues that we're not keeping up with. In water, it's caused by basically industry and agriculture hogging the system. And therefore, the people are badly served. For example, in Ireland, water is free. Well, why wouldn't it be free in America? Well, because 90% of it's being used by industry and agriculture. So how do we solve it? Well, we're not going to, I'm not going to go to Washington and try and um, pass laws. The lobbyists are too powerful. Instead, what we came up with the idea was to give industry and agriculture the gift of self-reliance. Let them do their own water treatment, which is good for them. They like it. Why? Because A, they have control over the water rates, and B, they can recycle, and C, they have less problems with those pesky regulators. And so they like it. And so our mission became to unburden the, the America's infrastructure and eventually the world's, we hope, so that the people, you and me, can have good water supplies and industry and agriculture is well taken care of both. Never thought about the fact that, you know, agriculture, I, I can understand that. Okay. But industry as a water hog. Wow. Never, never cross my mind. Well, look, in California, which is a heavy agriculture state, it's still 50-50, right? So the agriculture burden in California is 50% of the 90%, but industry uses a huge amount. For example, chip fabrication. Uh, you know, when you make beer, it takes seven to eight liters of, of water to make one liter of beer. And right now they just throw that water away, right? We have a very sort of um, disposable system and in America where we just don't recycle. And that's because we our, our water systems were built, you know, in the first part of the 20th century when that wasn't a concern. Now it is, right? Um, for example, Israel, which has a more modern system post-war, and of course, I'm old enough to mean post-war, meaning World War II, right? <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> uh, post-war, they built a system whereby they recycle almost 90% of their water. So, we have an old system. Again, we're not going to be able to fix it anytime soon. But again, self-reliance enables industry to do so. And that is going to save water uh, where there's water scarcity. And it's going to also save money for, for business. So it's a win-win for everyone. 
So on a small scale, individual scale, bringing it home, inside your home, what are some of the ways that we can really be conscious of not wasting food? I know this is going down, down to the microcosm, but I think it's important because, you know, like you were talking about California, they were being harassed about taking really short showers. Uh, but there's something to that. We waste a lot of water. Sure. Well, uh, now we don't work in the individual home space. We work with housing developments, for example. Okay. And that's relatively easy to do recycling because, you know, you have a central water treatment uh, plant for the development. Mm -hmm. And then so it all happens in one place. Now, if people want to implement what's called a gray water system in their home, they can do so. And it consists of taking the sink and shower water uh, and the laundry water and reusing that. But to do that, you have to invest in plumbing because you got to have what's called purple pipes. The purple pipes are the ones that go into the, the uh, gray water system. You can either choose to not really recycle it, just use it for your, watering your lawn, or you could improve it and theoretically even drink it but it's it's an expense that that for example they they did invest in heavily in australia a few years ago uh gosh about 20 years ago now because they were having terrible droughts <clears throat> and so um they heavily invested in home-based gray water systems it's worked well but um in america i i don't see that happening soon so what we're focusing on is there's a tremendous amount of new development going on Post COVID, a lot of people have moved to less dense areas and those less dense areas don't have, they have even less infrastructure than the cities have, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, For example, we're working in North Texas, which is booming right now uh, between Dallas and the uh, Oklahoma border. It's boom town there and, it's, and they're, they're building so fast that utilities can't keep up. And so we're putting in self-treatment at every single housing development that's that's implemented there. And that's proving very successful. So what we're really focusing on is all the expansion, the updating of the system versus getting back to the old stuff, because, you know, that's where the capital is available, right? So your company, if people want to learn more about what you're doing and stay in contact, how do they do so? It's actually not that hard. <laughs> so we have we have a Origin Clear is my company. It's been a public company for 14 years. You know, we have a amazing story, which we don't have to get into today, but since uh, uh, for the last um, 10 years, we've been in the water industry. And what we, um, if you go to originclear.com, you'll learn all about us. Now, what we've created in addition to that is a very important startup called Water On Demand. Now, Water On Demand tackles the two issues of number one, how do you downsize from the municipal utility down to the business, right? So compact technologies for the housing development, for the brewery, for the car dealership, whatever. And secondly, what if you don't have a million dollars cash to put into a water system? Well, we will let, let you have the water system, we'll retain ownership, we'll charge you by the gallon the same way the city does already. And that is called water as a service. And that's very exciting because it makes it accessible to everybody. I don't know about you, but you know, my wife has a very, she just got a new building for her school. Well, the last thing she wants to do is worry about the water treatment. But if you make it painless, like, yeah, just sign here. And it's just like a paying your water bill, right? Then it'll make it super easy. So water on demand for us is a major initiative. And it's very exciting what's going on. You can learn all about it at originclear.com. What's great is that whereas there's other companies that do this water as a service, it's not we're not unique. We're the only ones that enable regular investors to come in and get royalties just the same way they get from an oil well, but it's a water system. And that's very popular. And people are investing in that right now through water on demand. Oil is what made this country boom, but water is what's going to help this country survive. In fact, the world survive. And not only that, you know, a lot of investors, they'll take the money from an oil well, but they'd rather take the money from a water well, a water, not a well, a water uh, treatment yeah. system, because, hey, it's water, right? How cool is that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. So is this um, functional only in the United States now, or is it elsewhere in the world? Right. So we're piloting in the U.S. because, of course, we're here and uh, we have existing operations that, 
have been doing very, very well. You know, we basically are doubling and tripling every year in terms of our business, our conventional business. And it's based in Dallas and in Virginia. And what we really want to do is get it right in the U.S. and expand from there. And we do it by replicating. In other words, this water on demand network, which is this um, water as a service network, we want to get it right. And then not try and build it in the Middle East, but get a partner in the Middle East who will do the same thing there, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And so we get an international network of partners who then um, carbon copy what we're doing here for their region. But if you're talking about the Middle East, um, there is talk about the fact that many of the major waterways there have started drying up, one of them being the Euphrates. And so, which has been the lifeline of that geographical area. Sure. So this is going to be something that's really going to benefit the people, you know, people that where they're finding where they used to have grasslands. All of that is drying up. So now they have to find a new way of bringing in water, conserving water. And I think this is very exciting uh, because everywhere on the earth, there are things happening. Uh, natural disasters are actually changing waterways mm-hmm. and the availability. So uh, again, this is one of those topics that is just so pertinent right now. I mean, it's like you've been working on it without knowing that you were going to be absolutely necessary. You have come, you have grown your company in a time where this is critical knowledge and critical technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just really admire that. You know, you've had the foresight somehow. Somehow you were given the foresight to know that, you know, water, (laughs) you knew it was important for life, but you didn't know how important it would be in the year 2023. That's amazing to me. And I just look at that as being spirit directed, you know, that you were able to do That's so kind, that's so kind. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a very um, experimental person. In fact, when I was in in, in marketing, I I invented the term mistake-based marketing. In other words, try things out and see if they work. Some people call it throwing things at the wall, see if they stick, right? It's it's a um, ex- experimental mode, like try this, try this, try this, try this. And what we did starting in 2016, we really felt, you know, we, we I, I identified this this new trend towards self-reliance, decentralization, and nobody knew or cared about it. And I wrote, a, a, you know, a major article in a water trade magazine at the time that kind of set our stake in the ground, like this is what we're focused on. And, and then we had to you know, number one, invest in the technology. And we found one in 2018 that we've built steady since. And then in 2020 with COVID, we, we, you know, we thought the world was coming to an end. I mean, we didn't, at the time, we didn't realize that the government was going to give a bunch of money to everybody, most of all the big cats, but uh, that's a whole other <laughs> story. <laughs> that's a whole other story. We got a little bit of it. We got, we got some crumbs, but the point is we didn't know that was going to happen yet. And so we're like, oh, nobody's going to have any capital. What do we do about it? And that's when we came up with the water as a service concept. That co- the, 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 Those two things combined with the, the, the fund that regular investors can invest in, those three pillars became what we did. And I can't say that it was invented in the first place. It was something that we kind of just broken field running almost, right? Uh, uh, can't go here. Try this, try this, try this. Oh, there's a regulatory problem with this. Well, maybe we do it this way and and kind of just working our way through. And my um, collaborator, Ken Berenger, was pivotal to creating Water on Demand because he is just a super creative guy. And together we built this thing, you know, one day at a time, basically. People are pretty amazed to hear that, you know, water is becoming an asset. Why? Because, you know, it's kind of like when a monopoly breaks up, it creates all kinds of commercial opportunities, right? For example, AT&T broke up and it turned into MCI and the the baby baby bells, but even eventually the internet, right? All that came out of the AT&T breakup. So when water breaks up, we're going to have similar opportunities. And so we're having what we call a water tech boom that's beginning. Now, the ordinary investor like you and me normally does not get to get in on these things, right? They have to be connected. They have to be inside. Um, But we are focused. We have a saying, water is the people's asset. And so we want people, regular people, to be able to invest. We have an offering for the 
the accredited investor, there's you know the one percent types, but also we we have an offering off and on for everybody. Uh, you know, invest a thousand dollars, and and we believe that that you know it's all going to be fixed not just with the fat cats, but with just regular investors because you want a movement, you want a lot of people involved, right? Mm-hmm. That's how it makes it exciting. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Starting now with. Um, develop things that are being developed. Right. Will this ever be able to help those areas that are already developed? And the one that comes to mind is New York City. How would this ever come into being? And I know it would have to be in the um, future. I didn't mean to do that. Lower my hand. Is it even possible? Oh, it absolutely is because you take an existing business and you take it off the grid. I uh, say, okay, back in the 80s, I had a business in New York City, uh, computerizing companies. And you know, New York City, you go in some place in the Bronx that is just the worst possible place. And it's a disaster. In the middle of it, there's some cool company that's just making nuts and bolts. And it's done it for like 60 years. And and they they got a great business and so forth. And I got to know those businesses. Now, what well, we can take that business and we can give it self-reliance so that it it, it can take care of its own water needs and we can do it with a service contract. They don't have to put a, bu- a bunch of cash out. We can do that with existing businesses and existing farmland. Mm, that's awesome. That is absolutely mind blowing. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. Um, that's something to think about. That is really something to think about. This is the te- technology of the future for how we will keep ourselves supplied with good water, you yes. know, growing here and it's going to expand around the world because everybody is in need of water. That is critical to life. You, no, no life can exist without water. So again, I am very honored to have met you and um, can't wait to learn more about what you're doing and how you do it. Oh my goodness. This is just tremendous. This whole concept yes oh yes i uh, again i am totally intrigued this is just so new and so different and you know again you're talking about when you were born and i was born pretty much right after that time too when we were children we never thought about water it was it was a given you know you go out and you play in the rain you go out and splash around in puddles or whatever yeah. you drink out of a faucet you know you know out of the water hose whatever water was not an issue it never occurred to us yes. that we would be still living and hearing the world talk about a lack of water so what you're doing is phenomenal it's just phenomenal yes it is yes unfortunately the world's become more complicated <laughs> And, you know, herbicides like Roundup are in 95% of the blood of all Americans. If you have a small amount, that's fine. If you have a large amount, then it's a problem, right? We we have to pay attention to all these pollutants. And the, the, the problem is really that the federal requirements for water quality are lagging far behind the science. If you go to, but there's a website called EWG, environmentalworkinggroup.org, ewg.org slash tap water. And mm-hmm. if you go to that, you can put in your zip code. And it will tell you right away what the water's like in your neighborhood. And it will say, yeah, it's compliant with this and this. But by the way, that's 5,000 times too high based on current science because they've learned so much since those standards were set. The federal government's not going to change those standards there anytime soon because the utilities can't keep up anyway. And so you have a problem where everybody's kind of just kind of like going, you know, as we say, whistling past the graveyard, right? Like, well, we're just kind of... Uh, pretend it's okay. And uh, unfortunately, it's not. Mm, that's awesome. You know, we we don't know. We, we, we trust to a certain extent, much less now than we used to, the system that we live in. But the fact that the people who are supposed to be governing those things that are critical to life, like water, can't, can't really, they can't do it because they can't, they can't keep up things are changing so rapidly and the laws and everything to get all that change would be mm-hmm. forever. Okay. They pretty much become complacent with it. 
Yeah. It was probably a lot of work to put it together in the first place. <laughs> so now it's there. It's like we don't really want to tackle that again. Well, here there's a couple issues. Number one, and by the way, the people in the water industry are wonderful people, but they they have what's called a silver tsunami where they're all aging out. Mm-hmm. And right now there are seven million unfilled jobs in the water industry right now. Wow. So number one. Number two, they are short of finance. That right. I, they can only raise water rates so much because then you start getting hurting the poor people already. You know, in certain municipalities, the default rate on water is 30%. It's very hard to turn off that water supply to a to a to a home. That's a big deal because yes. now the water rate uh, costs go sky high because they gotta go out and get bottled water. It's even worse. And their their hygiene goes down the tubes. I mean, it's 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 a not a good situation. So What's happened basically is that, like, let's take, for example, Compton, California. A few years ago, the water coming out of the faucet started running brown. And the people of Compton, California said to their local water district, "Um, what's this water? And the water district goes, oh, no, that's magnesium. It doesn't hurt you. Mm. (laughs) They they said, well, we'd rather have the water be clear, if you don't mind. (laughs) But then water district said, yeah. Well, for 15 years, we've been asking your city council for funds to do something about it, and they have not done it. And so we, sorry, we can't help. Eventually, that that water district was was absorbed by the LA um, Metro District, and the problem got solved. But the point is, is that you have chronic underfunding going on. Mm -hmm. And it's not just Compton, California. It's all over the country. The solution, again, you know, um, I I was reading uh, an article that... um, one of our Swedish investors sent to us from Sweden and he sent me a translation and it basically said, Oh, we're having trouble with our water. We need to invest billions. And I thought, yeah, everybody says we need to invest billions, but nobody's doing it. Right. And so you like, let's take another example, Miami Dade County. When they first built Miami Dade County, it was done without any city planning and they ended up with over a hundred thousand septic tanks in the County. Mm. Septic tanks eventually fail. They pollute the groundwater. They propagate bacteria and viruses. And so they need to be replaced. Well, the city goes, well, we'll just um, invest $6 billion for to send sewage lines out to all those locations. Like, oh, where are you going to get the $6 billion? And by the way, it'll be $12 billion by the time you're done with it. Right. And it'll take 20 years and we'll tear up all the streets. How about you just give a credit to the homeowners to upgrade to their own self-contained system? Like, you know, decentralized water treatment. That's the, but that's not how the water industry thinks. They don't think, they think big central systems, but unfortunately those are not being funded. Yes. Wow. This is a critical conversation. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, it is. Well, Riggs, again, amazing. I'm so glad you said yes to coming back. I am very much happy that Ruth got to meet you finally, because I was so excited after our first interview (laughs) about what I learned. I was like, oh my goodness, this is deep. And, Mm -hmm. you know, again, people can invest to make a difference in the the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And to gain knowledge of what to not be oblivious to what's really happening. I think that's the most important thing, the educational piece of, you know, our water is a problem and it shouldn't be, but it is. So these are the ways that we can deal with it. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's my privilege to do so. And uh, I I, believe me, I, I love talking about it. So Let's check back in in a few months, and uh, because I, there's big things happening, I can't even talk about. We'll see what what what's to come, what's to pass yet. Alrighty, that's a day. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Looking forward to it. So thank you, Riggs. It's a great pleasure, ladies, and I wish you the uh, great rest of summer, and may your water be pure. Absolutely. Like that. <laughs> that was super cool, uh, and I love those ladies there. They, they ask all the right questions, and it was a very enjoyable podcast. All right, so I'm going to cover some quick news items now. We have the what's, what's called the Ripple story, and let's just see what that's about. 
I ran into this story on BlockWorks Daily. And uh, just so you know, the, the Ripple ruling basically said that Ripple as a token was not a security. Now that means, well, if it's not a security, then what is it? It's money, right? But now selling tokens here says, suddenly looks much better way to raise capital than selling stock. Well, we, as you know, have developed a, a token concept called dollar H2O. Um, it's trademarked, it's being patented. And we've put the development on the back burner really to focus on you know, what's going on in, the, in, our, in our business this year. But as it says here, the, divi the dividend on a token could even be paid in tokens. So the way to pay dividends for water on demand being paid through a token has now been made super possible. And it talks about paying for stuff at Starbucks, et cetera. And this is where it's going. So it's, as it says here, the first would surely be ridiculed and imposed. So, because remember, this is the saying, all truth passes through three stages. First is ridicule. Second is violently opposed. Third it is accepted as being self-evident. So I believe that we're in the, we're in the ridicule stage, but that's fine because we're not doing this token right away. We believe that by the time we focus on it, it will be accepted as being self-evident. So with that, let me cover the next piece of fascinating news. The world's top 15 economies through time. All right, so I'm actually going to go ahead and pull up the website. So this one here is very interesting. The US obviously dominated all the way through 2022, but now it starts to go south. Now, China rose from being number seven in 1980 and all the way to number one. Uh, well, number two in 2022 and number one in 2050. I happen to disagree with that assessment. Why? Because I share Peter Zihan's view that China will implode from uh, loss of population. Peter Zihan says it'll be by 2030. I think that's too early, but definitely by 2050 and 2075, it will affect their position. But let's take a look at some of the others here. Germany, definitely falling behind ending up number nine in 2075. That's not great for them. Mexico coming up in the world gradually into the almost into the top 10. Uh, Brazil also rising. But look at the rise of Nigeria and Egypt. Nigeria for number 15, Egypt for number 12, and just popping up. They weren't even on the chart in prior years. So that's really fascinating. Japan going away, again, it's a population issue. And also Russia starting fairly strong, they actually came out of nowhere and to come up in 2022 to number nine, but then they start fading. Again, a population issue. Indonesia rising rapidly as well, coming out of nowhere to emerge. So in the 2050 timeframe, which is realistic, I write off China. US, no. I think India is going to be very strong. Indonesia, I think that we'll also see places like Nigeria do even better. Now, why am I showing this? Why am I getting into this? It's because as these things occur, it's going to result like the China having its problems, et cetera, is going to accelerate the process of manufacturers coming back to the United States. And I think that is a, an absolute trend. It's already happening. There's uh, already, there's basically a skilled um, labor shortage in Mexico, Northern Mexico already. Uh, that's going to continue. Um, and so what does that mean? More and more factories moving to North America, be it Canada, America, primarily South Texas, and also Northern Mexico, they will move in. And this is going to create stresses on water fresh water, but also water, dirty water. What do you do with your dirty water? Right now in Mexico, a lot of local Mexican companies do not adequately treat their water. And as a result, these rivers are very, very polluted. But when it's American controlled companies, then their own boards and their own governance requires them to be responsible in other countries. And so this is already leading to better water treatment in Mexico. And what I'm saying is that as these factories come back from the China, they will be a massively updated and turn it, you know, automated and will not require a lot of people, but B, they will have built-in water treatment. And we're gearing up for that because there will be a huge boom of these factories and warehouses, and we will be part of it. I feel sure. All right. So what's next? This is a fun one. Don't be so squeamish about drinking water from sewage, says Environment Agency Chief in the UK. The idea is, is that you should, you should love drinking water that's made from sewage. And technically that's true, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a very hard time. That's why it makes no sense to have the central utilities try to reprocess the water. First of all, they don't have the plumbing, they don't have the infrastructure. They can barely deal with the dirty water as it is. So let the 
self-reliant local businesses do the recycling for things that are not drinking water, things that are like uh, irrigation or washing down uh, steam vessels or whatever, whatever it is that they need. So that's what's going on there. And it's frankly kind of ridiculous. Finally, there is a clip I want to play for you. Here it is. And you'll see exactly why I'm playing it. So this is on the CB Insights to, uh, Twitter account. If I explain to, you know, the listeners how crazy our software system is and why it's so difficult for legacy car companies to get software right, you, you'd be, it, it just, well, I'll do it very quickly. Yeah. So to save probably $500 a vehicle or let's say 350 quid a vehicle, Yeah. we, we farmed out all the modules that control the vehicles to our suppliers because we could bid them against each other. So Bosch would do the body control module, someone else would do the seat control module, someone else would do the engine control module. Right. And, and we'd have about 150 of these modules with semiconductors all through the car. The problem is the software are all written by, you know, 150 different companies and they don't talk to each other. Right. And so even though it says Ford on the front, yeah. I actually have to go to Bosch to get permission to change their C control software. Right. So wow. even if I had a high speed modem in the vehicle and, and I had the ability to write their software, it's actually their IP. And I have 150, we call it the loose confederation of software providers, 150 completely different wow. software programming languages. You know, all the structure of the software is different. It's millions of code. And we can't even understand it all. So, yeah. you know, that's why at Ford, we've decided in the second generation product to completely insource the electric architecture. Right. And to do that, you need to write all the software yourself. But just remember, car companies haven't written software like this Yeah. ever. They've yes. never written software. So we're literally writing how the vehicle operates, um, the software to operate the vehicle for the first time ever. That's a very scary thought. I mean, Ford trying to invent software. This is why Tesla has such a commanding lead. But it also illustrates why a single unitary platform is so vital. What made sense back in the pure hardware days of sourcing out to all these subcontractors and then the main uh, manufacturer just being an assembler of all this stuff, that's dead because you have to have a seamless uh, network. And that's what we realized about Water On Demand is that our network our whole network management needs to be seamless and single. It's also a strength because as we build it and then replicate it, it's our network. And it's just like Tesla, it becomes a market leader. Very exciting. And with that, we come to the free willing discussion. You know, if you didn't change your voice at that moment, I wouldn't even know to come on, right? It's always that free willing discussion. Okay. Good evening. I get to be a DJ. There's so many things to cover here. First off, I can't believe people have a problem with toilet to tap. Who wouldn't want to pay for that? Maybe somebody should tell them that if you treat the water upstream where it's being affected, you won't have to recycle that, you know, municipal based water, right? But no, look, and, and that is, you know, again, more validation. It's exciting because it's more validation of what we, of what we do. The Ford thing is amazing. It, it fits in with that kind of like, you, even in your interview, the U.S. is stuck with all this legacy infrastructure, right? Telephone poles, right? right. Why did it take, you know, why did why did it take so, I mean, nobody uh, from now, nowadays, people just ask me when, when I fill out forms, what's your home number? I go, home number, what's that? That's the number the cable co company gave you that you've never used. And it's part it of your rings sometimes randomly. I know. And it's your cable. Well, you don't even answer it because you're like, no, anyone who has that number, they're not for me, right? Because I nobody knows that number. Um, but it, it's so. It, but it's also it, about it's also about what Tesla did right is everything is under one vendor, right? Oh. So the radio, the you know they use Spotify, but it's all the same user user interface, and it makes like simple. So this is why um, it's so important what we're doing with what on demand that it is one network, a single sure. network to manage all sure. those. And it's all born from that same nucleus, right? In other words, everything springs forth from that central hub. Therefore, everything's talking to each other already. 
Mm-hmm. Ford was talking about like how this guy doesn't talk to this guy who doesn't talk to this guy. That's what eliminating that from the get go, skipping over the telephone poles, going straight to cellular. That's what we're doing in water. We're we're skipping over the uh, a lot of folks bring up, you know, well, what about city infrastructure? Forget about city infrastructure. That is it's, its own world. Yeah. And they can they can operate for decades in that environment. Like, you know, the 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 uh, American waterworks of the world will be able to do these billion dollar jobs forever because it's not going to go away. We're right. simply everything that happens outside of that. And if we treat and if it's an upstream problem and if we deal with it upstream, then, of course, the downstream net effect is dramatic. So there won't be a need. Uh, good folks. Good news, folks. There won't be a need for toilet to tap. OK, um, now, one other thing that that American economy thinks so. You know, it talks about China being first. You and I both very much buy into the Peter Zihan. Zihan. I, I've never. We, Peter Zihan. Peter Zihan, I think. Tomato, is the, tomato. Yeah. Right. Um, so he, you know, he believes they're going to literally implode uh, from the one child policy as a result. Now, they will take steps to mitigate that. They're going to make in, in, inroads into Africa and all that stuff. But you're right. Um, you can't go from a billion people to 300 million people without your economy collapsing. Now, the places that the economies are ex- are exploding is where? Where there's a big birth rate, India, Nigeria, right. parts of um, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, for example. Now, what what India is going to have to do, have to, is they're going to have to decentralize their populations, right? You see these ridiculous photos and these videos of people getting on the train in New Delhi, and they're on top and they're on the side. I mean, it's just it's this insane amount of people concentrated. So you you don't want to stem your economic growth so so you don't want to you don't you don't want to have a, your version of the one child policy but india is a massive country and if they decentralize their population by utilizing technology and they're very technologically advanced well what does that require it requires building cities what i've often bragged about is we can build water infrastructure faster than you can put up the building so this type of thing we talk about it in that denison texas corridor because that's a microcosm of, of what's happening. But think about the implications of distributing this capability as we go outside of that, you know, U.S., right? Um, this becomes truly a global, you know, kind of a global phenomenon. And the fact that we're, we're turning the whole world into global islands, regional islands. Right. Is Funding make- islands. Yep. Yep. Well, you know, like resource islands, right? So mm-hmm. North America will be its own island. Mm-hmm. And, um I personally look forward to the next 25 years um, because, you know, I'm I'm going to go to 120. I'm just going to go for it. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to do it. Well, you'll only be 104, 105 at that point. I mean, if, you know. No, no, no. 71 to 25. It's, it's still less than 100. In my math, anyway. You're right. Okay. You're right. 125. Right. So, right. 100, okay. Right. Yeah. 25 years, you'll be, you'll still be under 100. So, spring chicken. <laughs> And and this job will keep me awake. That's for sure. It's been an amazing um, uh, week. Lots of good developments. And if you want to talk to Ken about it, I strongly recommend that you get a briefing because there's been major developments and you need to get the data from him. Also, 29th, Saturday, the the final New to the Street uh, that features Ken in his most recent interview, 6.30 p.m. Bloomberg. And finally, be sure to fill out your Zoom survey. We it really helps us. Can I can I say one thing before? Right. So good. You have my you have my information up. This last announcement, I I, I want I'm not going to go into uh, great detail, but if you're an investor in any of our previous series or an investor in what's happened recently, I need to speak to you about this under NDA because this has a major it can have a major impact on you. I should say. So it's really important that we talk about it, and I kind of, I, I kind of give you a more fulsome uh, briefing on the subject. Agreed, Rockstar. Fulsome it is. Let's do it. All Fulsom. right. Um, oh, I love Fulsome. oc.go slash Ken. Talk to him. He's got the goods. Everyone, thank you very much. It's been a great briefing, and uh, I look forward to next week. Stay tuned, and thank you, Ken. Good night.